Good evening, everyone. My name is Lisa Lewin. I am the CEO of tech education company General Assembly, and I am really looking forward to today's discussion about the role that responsible business leaders ought to play in a democratic society. Tonight, I'll be joined by three members of Business for American Promise, a coalition of more than 125 business leaders from Fortune 500 companies down to corner grocery stores who are calling for the 28th Amendment to end the problems posed by money in our political system. Those who sign the Business for American Promise commit to the following statement of principles. We believe in a strong democracy where government is accountable to the people it serves. We believe in a strong economy where companies compete based on the value they create in the marketplace. And we believe in a political system based on checks and balances and an open exchange of ideas. With that, let me introduce our panelists this evening. First, we have Donnell Baird. He is the founder of Block Power a smart buildings platform that markets, engineers, and finances renewable energy and energy efficient technologies to buildings in underserved markets. Block Power partners with governments, utilities, building owners, and community members to generate energy bill savings and reduce carbon emissions and generates financial returns and improve public health. Welcome. Glad to be here. Great to have you. Next, I'm happy to introduce Peter Schwartz. He is co-founder of the Global Business Network, a corporate strategy firm specializing in future think and scenario planning. He is the author of several books on future-oriented topics, including The Art of the Long View, Inevitable Surprises, When Good Companies Do Bad Things, and China's Futures. Peter has also worked as a consultant for many films, including The Minority Report, Deep Impact, and War Games. Uh, so we've got a veritable celebrity in our midst. Very nice to have you here. And finally, I'm excited to welcome Neil Simon. Neil is the former CEO of Bronfman Rothschild, which managed $6.1 billion until its sale in 2019. He was the chairman of the board of the Montgomery County Community Foundation and was elected chairman of the board of the Greater Washington Community Foundation in 2016. He and his family were recognized as Humanitarians of the Year by Interfaith Works in 2016. And in 2018, he ran as an independent candidate for the US Senate in Maryland. It is wonderful to have you here too. Welcome. Great to be here. Thanks, Lisa. So, you know, corporations have been in the news quite a bit in these last uh, several weeks for uh, what seems like an increased willingness to play a more active role on issues of democracy. Um, it's just been reported that several major companies paused their PAC spending after the January 6th Capitol attack. Um, hundreds of corporations uh, and their CEOs are currently rumored to have met to discuss halting donations to politicians and postponing investments in U.S. states that pass legislation that limit access to voting. Um, Major League Baseball moved its all-star game uh, from, uh, from Atlanta is yet another example. Um, you know, news reports coming out day in, day out of, um, of reactions to, uh, to some of the um, voting rights legislation coming out. So um, I think, uh, uh, Neil, if you don't mind, maybe we'll start with you. Um, is this sort of corporate activism, as some in the media have called it, is it appropriate? I think there's good corporate activism and bad corporate activism. Um, historically, we've seen a lot of bad corporate activism. A lot of it tends to be very partisan and I think contributes to the divisiveness in our society. When you have corporations dumping lots and lots of money on one ideological extreme or the other, that can be really destructive for democracy. And it's part of why I'm such a big fan of um, the American Promise Amendment. But I think at times corporate activism can be really constructive for our democracy. When you have companies getting behind nonpartisan reforms that improve the way our government works so that it better serves the American public, I think that's very constructive. So when it's in that spirit, I think it can be really helpful for us to evolve this great democratic experiment that we've got in this country. Peter, would you agree with that? Yeah, I think that's a very uh, useful way to frame it, Neil. Uh, and, you know, when I 
I, I, I put it perhaps simply, there's corporate activism that serves uh, public ends like general voting, for example, right? So killing voting rights is uh, not in anybody's interest other than a single party that can't, master, can't, can't muster registering enough voters. Uh, having said that, uh, on the other hand, there is a corporate activism that is narrow and self-serving. Uh, to get regulations changed. I mean, a, a good example of that we saw playing out uh, over the issue of uh, air quality regulations in the auto industry, right? Campaigning to toughen, to, to lighten auto regulation is narrow and self-serving and does not serve the public. That's the wrong kind of activism. On the other hand, supporting uh, voting rights that uh, enhance uh, democracy, that's the right kind of activism. So it, it isn't inherently wrong. However, having said that, uh, I think the, the truth of the matter is that on balance, uh, if, from my point of view, I'd rather have no activism at the corporate level. CEOs is a different story as individuals speaking out on issues of concern to the public as opposed to the corporation. I'd love to follow up on that. You know, the, the, the cover of um, the most recent Economist uh, talks about um, you know, they, they've weighed in and given their, their view and their opinion of, you know, where, where the line should be drawn. And they draw it in exactly the opposite direction that you do. They say that, you know, businesses should, uh, should be engaged in, in those and weigh in on those topics that are relevant for their business and their industry and should stay out of the rest of it. How do you, how do you square those views? You know, it's a, it's a great question. Uh, uh, I think I'm probably the oldest guy on this panel. I'm 74. And, and, and my activism as, in politics began in the civil rights movement in the 60s and the anti-war movement and so on. So I, I'm old enough to have gone to march in, in Mississippi. Uh, having said that, my real first political campaign was the 1964 presidential campaign. I worked for LBJ. I worked for a local congressman. My congressman lost, but LBJ won. But there was almost no corporate money, no collective money. It was all individuals contributing. And it felt really grassroots. It felt like the people speaking. And it was a very different political environment. In the early 70s, I went to work for an organization called the Stanford Research Institute. And we had a lot of government funding from lots of research agencies and the like. And I started going to Washington regularly. Uh, and I saw something happen that was really quite profound. And we see it playing out right now. And, and that is that uh, the 1970s were characterized by a period of institution building in Washington. Most of the federal agencies that we now consider the departments that are really dominant, EPA, HUD, DOT, DOE, uh, two DOs, Department of Education, Department of Energy, all, all these came into being in the 1970s. And with that came something very pernicious. When I went, started going to Washington, it was a much smaller town in 1972. And today, K Street and J Street have lots of lobbying organizations, lots of law firms. And you take the highway out to Dulles Airport, and there's all these corporate headquarters around that. None of that existed in the early 1970s. And with the growth of the federal government has come this vast enterprise of corporate lobbying to achieve corporate purposes, not public purposes, changes in regulation, new legislation, incentives, and so on. And this vast machinery has intermediated between the public and the government that serves them. And they are the dominant force now shaping the future of those agencies. I, look, I, I'm in favor of education, better transportation, better uh, uh, energy, cleaner air, all the goals of those agencies. I supported them when they came into being. Frankly, I didn't see coming this vast corporate enterprise that has now circled around it. And I think that is really what's pernicious because those agencies are not, those, uh, pardon me, those companies are not pursuing the public goods. They are pursuing a narrower sense of what, uh, uh, that is their own self-serving interest in the pursuit of regulations in their own favor. And I definitely appreciate you bringing in the long view. I think there are a lot of people who don't realize the extent to which this problem of money and politics um, has become only increasingly 
con uh, uh, complicated and convoluted recently. Um, uh, in the last, you know, this has been in certainly my lifetime, and there might be a little, a few years between us, but, uh, but uh, you know, the landscape that that uh, that existed in money and politics uh, when I was born is very different than the one that um that exists today. Um, before we we dive deeper though on the money and politics problem um, and the Twenty Eighth Amendment specifically, Donnell, I would love to get you in on this conversation. You know, you're no stranger to leading businesses that also create, um, uh, that also operate in service to to positive social impact. I would love to hear from you. What role do you think individual business leaders should play in defending, strengthening democracy? Uh, yeah, I mean, we, we're a startup. Um, we incorporated ourselves in Delaware as a public benefits corporation um, because I didn't even want the voice of individual investors uh, in our corporation to outweigh the needs of um, resolving climate change and doing the kinds of economic development work that I believe are necessary. And so because we're structured as a public benefits corporation, even inside of our um, board of directors meetings or the fiduciary obligations that we as managers of the company have to our venture capital investors and Wall Street investors, which include folks like Goldman Sachs and others, um, we can actually subordinate their financial returns to our to our uh, desire to pursue greenhouse gas reduction or job creation in low income communities. And so from day one, we've embraced a new kind of corporate structure that we think can bring in a new kind of capitalism where social and environmental responsibility is uh, paramount to management and not um, you know, demoted to being something that um, is you know, an afterthought to, to pursuing core profitability. And we, we still think that we have an opportunity to become a very big profitable company, but that profit shouldn't be the be all end all even inside our individual corporation, much less for the way that we run our whole society. And I, I agree with Peter wholeheartedly. I remember um, my college professor is Dr. Larry Goodwin, who wrote a book about the farmers in the 1890s called The Populist Moment. Um, it's called Democratic Promise, but the abridged version is called The Populist Moment. And it talks about farmers kind of rising up and forming a new economic system and then a new political party because they couldn't control the role of the bankers in the, the, the 1890s American economy. And, you know, we're, we're, we're not too far off from that today. Our, our politics have been overrun with corporate capital. I don't think that there should be a, a role for corporate activism and participation in our politics. I think it should be removed. Um, I think that the, the benefits on occasion of corporations here and there doing the right thing are, are far outweighed by the, 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 the negatives. And so um, I'm really excited about American Promise and this opportunity to renew our democracy and renew the democratic process, uh, promise of this country by going back to the states and state by state passing a constitutional amendment to remove money from politics. At least if I could add one other thing. You know, I was just about part, to send it to you, Neil. Part, part of my lens when I think about this question of the involvement of corporate America in US politics is that we have so many forces dividing us as a society right now. We have a bifurcated media that's forcing the American public to live in two different realities. We've got politicians that spend more time demonizing each other than they do actually working for the American public. And you've got you know, ec these um, ecospheres and social media where everyone just hears other people echoing what they're saying and we're so divided. So the lens, when I think about the involvement of American companies in our political system, I feel like it should really be focused on things that bring us together. You know, 40% of Americans America or more is against what you're standing for a company, maybe you shouldn't spend a lot of money arguing that point. And rather, maybe you should support initiatives like American Promises that are supported by the vast majority of Americans and that would change the way the system works. I think the, the only thing that Americans really agree about um, in terms of politics is that the system is broken and we're not getting good results. And, and I do think, I respect them, what you're saying about maybe companies should just stay out altogether, but I, I think that 
corporate American can play a constructive leadership role in reforming the system, in making it work better for Americans. And, and that's part of why I've gotten involved here. And Dale, I would love to, you know, maybe have you say a bit more, you know, you you ran for office, you ran for Senate in, in Maryland. I mean, you know, if, if, if anyone had a had a front row view and insight into the ways that uh, big money influences our politics, it's uh, someone who's, uh, you know, had to be an active candidate. What did what did you learn? And how how did that in, how did that experience influence, um, you know, your your position today? Well, one thing I learned that was shocking to me coming into politics was that if you're a big corporation or a really wealthy American and, and you wanna donate basically limitless amounts of money and do it anonymously in campaigns, you pretty much can do that, right? I don't think Americans realize that you pretty much can do that. You know, there's this whole world of dark money and yes, you can't contribute it directly to a campaign, but I, I was amazed. And listen, there was a, a super PAC form to support my campaign that I didn't even know about where a bunch of money um, went into it. Um, people writing, you know, six figure checks. I, I never understood how easy that was and how readily available it is and how broken the financial um, part of our politics is. And then the other lesson, I'll just tell you one more about money and politics is that, so I, I ran as a moderate independent. I ran against all this partisanship and divisiveness. And what I found is that I would get questionnaires from PACs um, and say, I'm a pro-business guy. I come from the private sector and I think that companies play a really important role in growing our economy and providing jobs. But I also think climate change is real and we should do something about it. But I would get questionnaires from one PAC that would ask me to check one column of boxes um, maybe all pro-business boxes. And then another pack asked me to check the opposite on all those issues. And the reality is, if you see nuance in any issue, if you're willing to compromise on anything, if you're willing to collaborate with anyone, you're not getting money from either of those sources. So I think that's, that was another one of my lessons about money in politics. It's part of what makes it so divisive, right? I mean, so much of that money is coming from two extremes and feeding all those negative ads that we all get so tired of seeing in October every two years. That, um, that right raises for, for me kind of something that I have a very difficult time explaining to, to, to you know, friends and family outside of this country, which is, you know, we have, we're in this strange moment where it's gotten easier and easier over the last decade or two, particularly since Citizens United. Um, it's gotten easier to make unlimited contributions to campaigns. And on the other hand, um, in that same time period, it's gotten more and more difficult uh, to vote. Um, you know, there was, you know, kind of Shelby versus Holder, which was sort of the first big um, uh, Supreme Court case that that undermined some of the key tenants of the Voting Rights Act. Um, and uh, ever since then, it's sort of been a field day uh, where, um, you know, individual states are mounting some, uh, what in my view, are fairly muscular attempts to just increasingly curtail voting. How would, and I, I invite any of you to weigh on this who have a point of view, and maybe Peter, you can get us started. How do you explain that? How do you explain you know, the rights of corporations um, increasing um, and accelerating, uh, whereas the rights of individual voters uh, seem to diminish? And what does that say about the health of our democracy? Well, I, I think it's a profound question. And, and look, you, you pointed to the Citizens United uh, decision and uh, other decisions that have limited the Voting Rights Act. Somewhere in the philosophy of the Supreme Court, the notion that an organization has the same uh, meaningful identity as an individual uh, developed as a, as a concept, and I find that fatally flawed. Similarly, the constraints that have been imposed by the Supreme Court on voting, the Voting Rights Act and the new measures by various states. So I see two very different futures for America. Uh, one future, the future I think that we're talking about here that we aspire to, and that I think the founders of this country aspired to, was to give people the right to control their own future, to see the future, to make decisions, to be part of a community that makes the important decisions that shape the future for themselves and for their children and their posterity. I think that is the kind of vision that uh, founded this country. Uh, the other future is a plutocratic vision. 
a vision of, of wealth and power concentrated in the hands of relatively few individuals and a fairly large number of very powerful organizations. And, and by the way, I include here not just simply private companies, I include other large entities of concentrated power, whether they're labor unions or universities and so on. Uh, all of those have PACs as well, and they don't necessarily pursue the individual interest uh, of either their members or their students or their faculty at their universities. They have higher goals that are the corporate goals. And those, I think, uh, are the fundamental alternatives for America. Either we're going to persist as a democracy and our children will enjoy the benefits of a meaningful participation in a larger community that decides its future, or we will become ever more cynical. We'll see voting participation to decline, uh, people willingness to participate, people's interest in politics. It will drift into a sphere of you know, power concentrated in a relatively few hands and will occasionally read about decisions that they have made in the pursuit of their interests that may occasionally uh, fall to us. And I think those are two very different futures for the country. And clearly, I'm in favor of the first and not the second. But the risk is that we're headed toward the second right now. I, I mean, I, you know, I, I have a very dark view of where we are politically. I, you know, before I became a climate tech entrepreneur, I, I worked as a senior staffer on three presidential campaigns. I worked for John Kerry in 2004, which was a disaster of a campaign, which I think is relevant to corporate money and big, and, and big money. I worked for as a senior staffer for Obama, and then I ran a labor union super PAC, which independently expended $90 million on behalf of Barack Obama's reelection campaign um, for the Service Employees International Union, which was the healthcare union. Um, which had the highest number of visits of any American to the White House was the president of that union during the passage of the health care bill, Obamacare. Now, we may like Obamacare. Um, should, should, should an organization that, you know, basically donates $90 million to the president's campaign have the most influence over Obamacare? And should people like me work for that super PAC? So, I am a fervent partisan Democrat, like I'm black. And so I'm a Democrat and we play to win in both political parties. Now, in the case of John Kerry, I think it's really important. <clears throat> John Kerry outsourced his field campaign and voter contact campaign across the country in 2004 to independent expenditures. It was not a side thing like as was the case in Neil's campaign, where he was running a campaign, and then there happened to be super PACs in his campaign. In 2004, as a senior staffer, let me assure you, John Kerry did not have door knockers, people going door to door with lists of voters. He left that operation in Wisconsin and Ohio entirely, 100% to the labor unions, who had funded a $100 million operation called America Coming Together that employed young 25-year-olds like me to run the field operation for the Democratic Party, except that we weren't the Democratic Party. We were an independent institution funded by a bunch of labor unions, which is all well and good if you win the election, which of course we didn't. But of course it's not well and good because once you get into the habit of outsourcing your relationship with voters, and you're the Democratic Party and you don't have real relationships with voters because you outsource them every year to a super PAC here or it's a labor union super PAC or it's the trial lawyers and they're Democrats so their money's good because they support our beliefs but other people don't, whatever. Then you don't have a really functioning political party. So you get to 2016 and you don't have Barack Obama and the independent operation that he put together as a campaign and you're left with this atrophied Democratic Party that we've had in 2004, stumbling into this 2016 election without Barack Obama's campaign operation. And that's why we lost to Trump, right? Because our muscles as a party had atrophied so significantly because we relied on outside money to run basically half of our ground game in presidential election. There's a winner take all um, mentality and reality that I think is very real in both political parties in each presidential election where it's it's winner take all. And if that means that you have to hold your nose and vote for Donald Trump, or that means that you have to, 
you know, restrict the rights of black voters throughout the entire country. Um, and that's what it takes to win, or it means that you have to pass an, you know, a Supreme Court victory that allows unlimited corporate contributions in order to help your side win. And you think that's what's necessary to win. That's what's been done. And that's where we are. So I think it's going to take a lot of work to get back from that dark place. But that's why I'm so excited about American Promise. I think it presents us a bipartisan pathway back to the country that we're supposed to be. And God knows we need it right now. Thank you both for that. Neil, I'd love to, to get you back in into the conversation. Peter has painted um, such a pristinely clear um, and, and terrifying um, view of, um, of kind of the two futures at stake. And then Donnell has, you know, given us, you know, the, the insider's view of, um, you know, dare I say it, the sort of rot and cynicism um, uh, kind of at the heart of, of, of all of this when it comes to actually, uh, you know, running campaigns in the business of politics. You know, maybe share with me any thoughts that you have about what's at, what's at stake here? Should Americans be hopeful or is all, all lost? I think Americans should be hopeful and I'm certainly hopeful. I mean, it's hard some days to be hopeful, right? When you see how dysfunctional our politics is, how unproductive it is, how divisive it is, but there are changes happening. Um, there are real reforms happening in this country. Um, we've had, I think in 2016, there were 23 different ballot initiatives passed around the country, different types of um, reforms, some around campaign finances, some around independent redistricting to counteract political gerrymandering. Um, this cycle, we had another 20 reforms or so passed, including some really exciting ones, like the one in Alaska that implemented top four primaries, where um, there's one open primary and the top four winners go on to the general election, where they use ranked choice voting to decide, which is actually a much better system that allows moderate candidates to, to win office much more regularly because it's much less dependent upon appealing to the base of one party or another. Um, but another thought on my mind is that I, I think enduring structural change to our political system is dependent upon it being bipartisan, truly. And if it's motivated because one side thinks it's going to benefit them, that's not going to work. It's, it's got to be motivated by people from both parties, by the 42% of Americans, including myself, that identify as independents. Um, it's it's got to be motivated by a cross-partisan coalition of people. And, and it's got to be done for the, the common good, for the, for the good of the country. And, it, we, we've got to really be careful about talking about reform in partisan language, about talking about it in ways where people portray it as, oh, it's going to help our side or it's going to hurt the other side. I, I think that that's not the way to get this done. And it's certainly, even if it gets done, it's, it's not the way for it to be enduring and for it to last. And I think we fall into that trap. You know, HR1, S1, the bill that's on the um, on Capitol Hill right now that's been approved by the House and um, hasn't been voted on by the Senate. Uh, my personal opinion is it had a lot of potential, right? There's a lot of great stuff in HR1, but it also is packed with a lot of partisan um, agenda items. And there was no effort made to bring in Republican co-sponsors. And it, you can't reform the way our political system works without one vote from the other party. That's, that's not the way our country was intended to operate. That's not, you know, when our framers of our constitution designed what they had, they, you know, George Washington was an independent, right? He was kind of a, a peacemaker among the Federalists and Anti-Federalists. And, and um, the model that, that we're supposed to be following is people working together for the common good. And that, that's that gotta be the spirit that we get this done in. And, you know, one of the things that attracts me to American Promise is I, I think Jeff Clements and his team are have been really good about bringing in people from, across the political spectrum. Yeah, uh, Lisa, just to add one thing here that uh, you, you mentioned something at the beginning of this conversation that I think is critically important. Uh, I'm an immigrant. Uh, I, uh, my family, I was born in a refugee camp in Germany. Uh, my parents were concentration camp survivors. Uh, we came to the United States in 1951. Why? Because we saw a beacon of hope, uh, a, freed, a vision of freedom, a vision of equality, 
where everyone was going to be treated the same uh, and that uh, it was a beacon of hope. And today, if you travel the world, that is not what you hear. People are still trying to come here because you know there's civil wars and violence elsewhere. But having said that, when they look at American democracy, they see the flaws that we're talking about. There's no big money. I mean, look, I've lived in the UK, I've lived in France, I've lived in the Netherlands, I've lived in Singapore, I've traveled. None of those places have corporate contributions. And, you know, politics in France can be crazy. In the UK, it can be even crazier. You know, they have the monster raving loony party, let's be clear. Uh, but the people participate, they know, they care. They read the newspapers, they watch the news. They are engaged in the life of their nation in ways that Americans have become disconnected from because they know it doesn't matter. And I think if we are to be a beacon to the world, if we are to demonstrate to the world that democracy works and that Chinese authoritarianism is not the vision of the future, that American democracy is the vision of the future, we have to reform our democracy because that beacon will soon be put out. Well, I think all... And I think all of you have made a very, very powerful case for uh, the the reason that brought all of us here, which is American promise and its um you know its advocacy and championing of the Twenty Eighth Amendment. Um, I would love uh, while we're here in kind of our our last leg of our of our talk today, I would love to hear from each of you. Um, why is the Twenty Eighth Amendment important? We've covered a lot of ground um, in terms of you know, money in politics and um, and civic health. Um, but let's talk about specifically the 28th Amendment. Why it is, why is it important? Why do you support it? Um, I'll, be, I'll be the most negative, so I'll start. I mean, again, I'm, I'm, I'm a Black American, so I don't care about what George Washington and the Founding Fathers or whatever thought because they thought that I was not a human and they thought that I was property and didn't care and they ripped the teeth out of their slave in order to form dentures for George Washington. I, I just couldn't care less about him and the founding fathers or what they think about how the government is supposed to work. Totally irrelevant to me. What is relevant to me is I have a five-year-old and we have a climate crisis. And when my son is my age, when he's 40, the planet and the, the, the climate is going to be an utter collapse. And um, many parts of the planet will be uninhabitable. As we see in Syria, there will be climate-led, drought-led civil wars as we have climate refugees moving um, from, from, from place to place. That's why so many migrants are coming up to our southern border right now because of the droughts in Central America. Um, and the only way to wrest control of our government from the oil and gas corporations is by passing uh, legislation and amendments that will allow us to, 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 to wrest control of the United States Senate away from the oil and gas and fossil fuel industries. That's the only path forward to creating um, uh, a, a habitable planet for my son. And that's what I'm about. So I don't have um, quite the respect for American traditions of democracy as a member of a race that could only vote legally in 1964. And my mother lives in Georgia and her right to vote has been curtailed even though it's 2021. So I don't, I don't have any idealistic loyalties to the American dream. However, I do have loyalties to my son and trying to make sure that I do everything I can as a father to take control um, of this government away from uh, the fossil fuel industry. Um, and so that is why the work of American Promise is so important to me. I'll, I'll, I'll chime in. Um, Thank you, Donnell. Yeah, first, I, I think I do have loyalties a little bit to the American dream, the land of opportunity. Um, you know, my mother was an immigrant who came here, kind of like Peter, and my father's parents were immigrants who came here. and they came here fleeing very difficult situations. And I think, Peter, I like your words. I mean, America should be a beacon of hope for everyone, regardless of where they come from, what they look like. Um, part of becoming that beacon of hope is having a functional democracy. And if you believe that the role that money's playing in politics today is corrosive and divisive, that leads to some of the dysfunction, 
then we got to do something about it. And we all got to do something about it together. And, and the 28th Amendment, going back to Lisa's question, is really about giving the federal government and state governments the authority to set limits on campaign contributions. I think that's healthy for our democracy. There are other things wrong with campaign finances, including the fact that you can hide in certain ways um, and give money anonymously, and including the way corporations are treated um, in terms of campaign contributions. But probably more than anything, it's about setting limits to the madness. I forget what was the number that there was 400, I, I, I forgot the number, how much money was spent on the Georgia Senate races? If somebody remembers, you can chime in with that, but just some obscene amount of money that 90% of which came from out of state, that's broken. So we, we've got to fix that. And I think we can do that together. And, and I'll just uh, finish by, you know, I, I support Neil and I'm, I'm, I'm empathetic to your, your feelings, Donnell, about the history of America. My experience is slightly different, as you might imagine. Well, uh, it's not a feeling. I mean, we, we Black people built the country. I mean, we're glad that you and your families could come and enjoy it, but we've been here the full time and we built it. So it's not, it's not my feeling, it's, it's just historical facts. Sorry, uh, I, I agree. Uh, the, the, the support for the 28th Amendment is very simple. Uh, this is a structural issue. Uh, this is an issue that can't be ha handled by kind of piecemeal reforms. Uh, it is something that requires fundamental change. And we have a mechanism for that, the constitutional amendment. Uh, and so I think, uh, you know, uh, uh, the best advice I got when I was a young man was if it doesn't take 50 years, it isn't worth doing. Uh, uh, big changes take time. I'd like it to happen a lot faster than 50 years, let me be clear. Uh, but uh, this is a long-term challenge. It's something we have to be persistent about. Uh, amendments don't happen easily or quickly. Uh, they happen over quite a long time, and I am excited about the American Promise campaign because I think they will be persistent to produce the structural change that we need to get the amendment actually passed. Thank you. It sounds like um, while there may be different um, pathways that uh, that got us here, um, we, I think we can all agree that there's got to be fundamental and structural change and that the very health of our democracy is at stake if we don't change it. Um, any final thoughts? And would love for you to share um, whatever final thoughts you, you'd like to before we wrap up. Um, sound okay? Sound good? Sure. Okay, great. Does anybody, anybody excited to go first? Yeah, I'll start. Um, well, I agree with Peter and Neil that um, the country is not full of hyper partisan warriors like regular Americans, re regardless of where they stand politically in terms of how they vote, they they care about most of the same baseline things like are their kids going to have a better life um, are their kids going to be properly educated? Is their family healthy and safe? Do they have work with a purpose and with dignity? Like, and, and we as Americans, we, we share that. And um, we're optimistic about the future and, and the possibility of our children having a life that's better than ours. That's what makes us American. And our politics is, is dividing us and, and, and they're, they're, it's really ruining the country. And American promise gives us an opportunity to get back to, you know, things aren't perfect and there's a lot of work to do, but it gives us an opportunity to get back to a place where we can all connect around our core common American identity and the things that make us uniquely American and special. And, um, you know, hope, hopefully this is a, an opportunity to, to, to refresh and renew um, um, that, that core identity that we all share as Americans. It, Donnell, that was so Donnell. beautifully said. And I will tell you from my campaign experience, talking to tens of thousands of people in my state, I do not believe we are nearly as divided as it always feels in the media and as our politicians make it seem like. Uh, in fact, I think it's the opposite. I think America is starved for leaders that could bring us together but truly bring us together, not just in rhetoric, but in action. And, and hopefully um, you know, reforming the way money works in politics can be part of that. 
Uh, one last thought is that American promise in my mind is part of a movement. It's part of a political reform movement. And there are thousands and thousands of Americans that are working really hard to change the way politics work in this country. American Promise is a leader in that. There are other groups like um, Unite America and Represent Us and Stand Up Republic. Um, we need it to be millions of people. We need everyone who listens to this to recruit 10 more people and to get them to get involved in this movement to make our politics work better and to get them to support different organizations and volunteer. And a great place to start would be with American Promise. Thank you so, so much, Neil. Peter, you'll have the yeah, last word. Uh, just two thoughts. And uh, uh, one is that uh, Anil mentioned something earlier that's important to keep in mind. Uh, uh, I'm from California. And California uh, in the 2010s uh, engaged in several political reforms that changed how we vote in the state. And as a result, we have coherent politics in California. You may not like the outcome, uh, but having said that, we actually can get stuff done. Uh, and we have actually engaged in the beginning of political reform. It's not great. It's better than it was, is what I would say. And it says that political reform, it took a while to get there, can actually make a big difference. And it has, and California is an example of that. The second thing, and my final remark is this, and it goes back to something Donnell said. Look, I, I have a 30 year old son, you have a smaller son, I'm a bit older than you. Uh, and and uh, surveys show again and again and again, that if you ask Americans the question, will your children be better off than you are? Overwhelmingly, they say no. They've lost faith in the future. And that, when a country loses faith in its own future, is a crisis. Our kids need a better future. We need to build a better future for them, and they need to build a better future for their kids. And that faith in the future was something that brought my family to America. I had as a kid, but my son does not. And that is what needs most of all to be restored, is that faith in the future. And that's what I'm hoping that passing something like the 28th Amendment will enable our kids to have better faith in the future. Amen, amen. Well, I cannot think of a more fitting end than that. So we will leave it there. Thank you so much for joining us today, um, all of you out there. And thank you again, Peter Schwartz, Donnell Baird and Neil Simon. We look forward to seeing all of you throughout this National Citizen Leadership Conference and to the work ahead for American democracy. If you would like to continue the conversation and get involved, you can do so on the American Promise website, AmericanPromise.net. And given the positive impact that businesses and business leaders clearly can have in this time of challenge and opportunity for American democracy, please do consider joining America Promise's National Business Network. You can review the statement of principle add your name and connect with other business people involved in the network. Again, visit AmericanPromise.net for more. Thank you all and good night. Thank you, Lisa. Thanks, Lisa. Thank you.